All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Wednesday webinar. Today, we have Brittany, EcoCycle's own Brittany, uh, who's going to be taking it away to give us a little bit of an intro on Microplastics 101. Plastic Free July, so it's very fitting that we're starting it off with microplastics. I would say probably one of the things people know the least about or are the least familiar with. Um, and as folks in the business industry that want to be leaders uh, in their given field. This is a great thing for you to learn about. The next few webinars are going to be all about different aspects of microplastics. So next week, we're going to have um, a professor from School of Mines uh, who was one of the co-authors for the, um, the paper, It's Raining Plastics. And he's going to say, he's going to do a presentation on raining plastics now what? Uh, we'll figure out what the next steps are and hear what he's doing. And the following week, we have a special guest uh, presenter from the UK who will be joining us. A presentation on microplastics and textiles. She's um, an engineer and she's going to talk about some new advances that she's working on. And we have a couple other uh, folks coming down the line too that are super exciting. Um, so with that, oh, one other thing. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to do the Q&A or the chat. I'll be paying attention to that. Um, Brittany doesn't have to worry about that. And I'll be the one asking the questions at the end of the presentation for y'all. Um, again, Green Star Business Webinar Wednesday. Um, Brittany, take it away. Awesome. Hi guys, thank you for having me. So my normal role in EcoCycle is I'm one of the educators in the schools department. So when we're having a normal year and we're in schools, I get to go to all the schools and teach kids how to compost and recycle. And then we also do some lessons on things like um, water conservation and then some general um, ecology things. Um, but there's also a little like niche in our department for microplastics. It's kind of our little like passion project. Um, and my background, I have a master's degree in marine biology and environmental education. So I have a strong-ish background in science. Um, and so that's kind of where I like to come at this lens from. So we're gonna talk a little bit about exactly what microplastics are, um, where they come from, how they affect generally the environment, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what EcoCycle eco has done to help the microplastics problem in our own little small way. Um, so microplastics is actually a really hard thing to define, um, but generally it's a piece of plastic um, that either can be what's called a primary microplastic. So think about like a micro bead in a personal cleansing product, like a lot of our face washes used to have microbeads in them for like exfoliation, or it can be a secondary microplastic. So something that's created from the eroding of a bigger piece of plastic. Um, and generally they're considered a piece of plastic that's smaller than about five millimeters. So think about like a sesame seed. So something smaller than about a sesame seed. Um, and typically they're harmful to things. Um, so just some general stats about plastic. Um, pretty much all plastics that have ever been made still exist in our environment. Um, and then scientists estimate by 2050, if we keep going at our current rate of plastic productions, there will be as much plastic by weight in the oceans as there is fish mass. Um, and we found microplastics in pretty much any environment. They found it in Arctic snow, we found it in Rocky Mountain National Park, um, which basically means that we found microplastics in our water cycle, which you guys are gonna hear a lot more about next week. Um, and then each year we dump about 8 million tons of plastic in our oceans, which is the equivalent of taking a dump truck and backing up to the ocean and dumping it every single minute. So this is a, a pretty good visual of what microplastics look like. So. Um, we have our sesame seeds and our little microplastics. Um, and believe it or not, um, be, through the food chain, we consume microplastics every day. So every week, we consume about five grams uh, of plastic 
which is enough to fill a porcelain soup spoon. So if you've ever gone to like a sushi restaurant and they have like the soup spoons that you eat like miso soup with, that full of plastic we eat every week. Every month we eat a small rice bowl of, soup, of plastic, which is about 21 grams. Every six months we eat 125 grams of plastic, which is our average cereal bowl full of plastic. Every year is 250 grams of plastic, which is a heaped dinner plate. And now this is where, to me, it starts to get really scary. Every 10 years, we eat 2.5 kilograms of plastic, which is about a standard life buoy. And every, over the course of our lifetime, we're gonna eat about 20 kilograms of plastic, which is about the equivalent of eating two recycling toters worth of plastic. So think about just like going up to your recycling toter outside of your house and taking a bite out of it. We consume two of those by weight every year in plastic. So we'll talk a little bit about how that happens um, over the course of the presentation. So scientists um, wanted to figure out what the consequences of having that plastic um, in the ecosystem has just on the environment, including our health. So we know that macroplastics or large plastics impact um, animals and the environment. So we know that we've seen pictures of large animals have issues with large plastics. We know that animals suffocate when they eat large plastics. We know that they can become entangled when they um, interact with large plastics like fish nets or fish lines. Um, and we know often when large animals eat large plastics, it can result in suffocation. So these are all things that we're fairly familiar with. Um, so it stands to reason that when small animals interact with small plastics, that there's going to be similar impacts on them. And it also stands to reason the more dependent that we become on plastics, the more that that's going to become um, prevalent in our ecosystems. So the more that we use, the more we're gonna see it. Um, so for example, the last 40 years, we've seen a significant increase in plastics in our environment and in our ecosystem than we had previously as our lives have become more and more plastic dependent. So we do know that small marine organisms do consume plastic. So a little pointer. So this picture is of a salp. So a salp is a filter feeding organism. They're actually not that unrelated to us. They're considered chordates. Um, but they're a clear filter feeding organism that can form colonial chains that are found um, free swimming in the open ocean. And they're often the basis of aquatic food webs. And they've been found to have small microplastics in their bodies. So filter feeders, so anything that basically filters the water and eats tiny, tiny things inside of it, whether it's something called marine snow, which is basically any nutrients that they can pull out of the water, or plankton, are more likely to consume microplastics, um, which means that it's a source of those microplastics entering the aquatic food web. So we're gonna take a look at a quick video of, these are all different plankton, and the little green balls in the video are balls of polystyrene um, that they've added a fluorescent dye to, so it's easier for us to see. And you can actually see the polystyrene balls being consumed by the various plankton in the video. So this plankton is a copepod. Um, it's a really common free-floating planktonic organism. It's actually what like plankton in SpongeBob is based off of. So you can see it using its legs to filter those. Um, this is a different cell and you can see those polystyrene balls entering its digestive tract and entering its stomach. Um, and going all the way through its body. And then this guy right here, it's a zoea. It's actually the larval stage of a lobster. So these guys are gonna grow up and become lobsters one day. So lobsters, crabs, all those guys go through a planktonic life stage um, where they're gonna be free floating and pretty small and they're gonna consume 
uh, anything smaller, including microplastics. And the reason that's scary for us is we consume things like lobsters. Um, so there's a process uh, you may be familiar with called bioaccumulation, which is just the accumulation of chemicals in living tissues. Um, and they build up because a lot of these things can't be broken down easily, and eventually they end up on our dinner plate. So for example, one of those plankton, say that lobster zoea, it eats one or two pieces of plastic over the course of its lifetime. Well, say a small fish eats 10 zoea, and each of those 10 zoea had two pieces of plastic in its body. Well, that means that small fish has now has 20 pieces of plastic inside of its body. Well, then a medium-sized fish, if it eats 20 small fish, that fish will now have 20 pieces of plastic inside of its body. And then if a large fish eats 10 small fish, that large fish will now have two, 200 yeah, pieces of plastic and on and on up the food chain, it'll increase. And we tend to eat animals close to the top of the food chain. So think about the fish that we like to eat. We tend to eat things like tuna, salmon, cod, all of those are animals right at the top of the food chain. So they're gonna have the highest concentration of pollutants in their body because they're eating everything below them. Uh, now, you would think maybe they eat the plastic but it goes straight out of their body. So it's not a problem. They eat it and then they poop it out. It's not a big deal. Um, but a study in 2008, um, specifically looking at mussels, which are a filter feeding organism. So they filter water, they get food from it. Um, they found that it moved from their gut to their hemolymph, um, which is their blood system, and then it stayed in their body for at least 48 days. So if any organism eats that muscle, within those 48 days, they're going to also be consuming those plastics. So things that eat mussels, birds, crabs, starfish, um, predatory whelks, which is a, their type of predatory snail, and then of course we humans, also enjoy eating mussels. Um, and it's also been found at food that was at seafood markets. So in a study in 2015, uh, scientists looked at food that was being sold at a seafood market. So it was a market in California and a market in Indonesia. They were looking at shellfish that was being sold for human consumption and they found either microfibers so things that came off of textiles or microplastics in a quarter of the animals that were being sold for consumption. So this was food that was gonna go to a restaurant or someone's dinner plate. And we know when we eat these plastics, um, there have been studies done both in humans and um, in rats and mice, which are often used as a proxy for human study, um, that when we eat microplastics, it also moves from our gut into our hemolymph, so our blood and our lymph system. And then it's gonna pass into muscles from that. So we know that it does, we do excrete some of it. So some of it is just gonna go straight through us, but some of it does move from our gut into the rest of our body and we are gonna store it there. Now the big reason why this is a problem is not because of the plastic itself, but because of something called persistent organic pollutants. Now, one of the most famous persistent organic pollutants is DDT. So persistent organic pollutants are lots and lots of things, um, but persistent organic pollutants generally are what are called hydrophobic. So they don't like being in water. So they're gonna bond to things that aren't water. So if there's uh, persistent organic pollutants, or they're often referred to as POPs, floating around in an aquatic environment, they're gonna to try to attach to something that is not water. So if they see a little tiny piece of plastic, they're gonna to bond to that piece of plastic, which means those plastics are gonna all of a sudden be covered with these pops. Now some pops like DDT have been shown to have fairly minimal effects on people, 
but that is not the case for all of them. So if things like birds are starting to consume microplastics, they might become more exposed to a chemical like DDT at a higher concentration if they're consuming those microplastics. So the research is pretty well um, studied for microplastics in a marine environment, but microplastics are a fairly new thing. Um, we've only been looking at them for the last 20 years or so, and there's a lot of gaps in the knowledge on how microplastics interact in freshwater ecosystems and really in soil ecosystems. Um, so there's a couple studies in soil ecosystems, but it's really unknown. Um, so we know that they can be ingested by what are called the micro and mesofauna. So think about things that live in soil. So things like earthworms or mites or insects, things that live inside of the soil ecosystem, which is going to start that same bioaccumulation thing inside of a soil food web. We also know that it can change how soil works. Um, and then we know plastic sticks around for a long time. So some new research that has come out um, just in the last year. Um, in China, microplastics were found in the gut of 94% of terrestrial birds. So these are birds that are foraging in freshwater um, and agricultural systems. So we know that they're getting them from food that either feeds in freshwater or um, soil ecosystems. So we know that somehow microplastics are entering those ecosystems. Um, we're also seeing increasing concentrations of microplastics or when there's increasing concentrations of microplastics in soil, um, we also see increasing microplastics in earthworm castings and chicken feces, which are a huge food source for a lot of organisms. Um, so that can be another way where that starts to get into higher food webs. Um, and then specifically for earthworms, which we all love because we know that it gives us healthy soil, um, microplastics can be a nucleation site, so it can bond with zinc, um, which is toxic to earthworms. So we know that it can be a source for something that can cause mortality in earthworms. So these are all new things that we're finding um, just very recently within the last year. Um, and then this is a little side note, but I wanted to talk about it. Um, just before the pandemic, uh, the World Health Organization put out a study on microplastics in drinking water. And this is specifically focused on um, water coming out of water treatment facilities. So this is from like filtered drinking water. So think about water that comes out of our water treatment facility and out of our tap. And right now, uh, their research indicates the water that you're drinking that comes out of your tap, while it does contain some microplastics, the level that we are drinking microplastics is currently safe to human health. Um, and part of that is the WHO is much more concerned about how microbes interact and affect human health much more than microplastics. Think about how many people die every year because they get dysentery or some other disease that's caused by a microbe in drinking water. Um, and that research is much more known and those deaths are much much more understood. And so that's where the WHO wants uh, water treatment facilities to focus their energy on is to clean microbes out of drinking water because we know the detrimental health effects of microbes in drinking water. But they were really clear to emphasize that it is still clear that microplastics do have impacts um, on wildlife and in untreated ecosystems. Some positives, now that I depressed all of you. Um, so EcoCycle has done some things to help about it. Um, so compost is a potentially major source of microplastic contamination in the environment. Um, but initially, 
a little over 10 years ago, no one had connected the dots between um, what happens when you put plastic coated paper products. So think milk cartons, ice cream containers, coffee cups, paper plates, all of those things, when those end up in compost and if they generate microplastics. So EcoCycle eco decided we were gonna make that connection. Um, and then we also work um, with other composting programs around the US um, to ensure that they have clean composting programs to try to make sure that they also are not sources of microplastics. So all of these are examples of plastic coated paper products. So some programs in the US do allow these in their compost. So things like milk and juice cartons, ice cream containers, hot and cold drink cups, paper plates, frozen food containers, takeout containers, all of these things are allowed in some compost programs in the United States. Now, a lot of people, especially with the milk cartons, think, well, that's coated in wax, so it's fine. Um, and 40 years ago, that was totally the case. But now our milk cartons are coated in polyethylene. So they have like a plastic coating on the outside and then paperboard and then a plastic coating on the inside. And then are things like our shelf stable cartons. So think like um, a, a juice box or a uh, soup carton that you get on the shelf. They have a plastic coating, a paperboard coating, a plastic coating, an aluminum coating, and then another plastic coating. So none of these are gonna be very compostable. So what we did was we partnered with um, Woods End Laboratory. And <laughs> um, their Woods End Laboratory is actually one of the labs, one of the two labs in the US that actually tests whether or not products are compostable. So if you get a compostable uh, container that says like EPI certified, this is one of the places where they sent one of those containers to test that. And we put a bunch of these containers through the same test to see if they actually were compostable. Um, so it's a 180 day test um, and we put these things up for it. So this is the list of things um, that EcoCycle and Woods End tested to see if they were compostable or not. Um, so we tested uh, like the gable top, like milk and juice cartons. We tested frozen food containers. We tested um, paper plates. We tested paper cuts. And we looked to make sure that we had a bunch of different kinds of coatings. So this um, LDPE or low density polyethylene is the same kind of plastic that like a grocery bag is. Um, and then PET is the same kind of plastic that like a thin plastic water bottle is. And to no one's surprise, after five weeks, nothing really composted. So these are a couple of our things under a microscope. So our Nesquik milk container, you can even still read the words on it after five weeks. So we found out plastic, not compostable. Um, so our big conclusions, plastic coatings don't biodegrade. In fact, having plastic coatings actually slowed down the biodegradation of the paper layer on the inside. And then when things are coated on both sides with plastic, it means that that paper on the inside isn't going to degrade either. Um, and then even when our things were basically whole at the end of it, they all shed microplastics at the end. So even if we had basically a whole milk carton at the end, if you looked at the compost surrounding it, they were full of microplastics. Um, so we have some images of like our Nesquik carton after they've been sitting and we still have big whole chunks left. Um, and like our Minute Maid container has the beginning of what's called delamination. 
So it's starting to, the plastic is starting to pull away. Um, and as you can see now, well, what happened? So delamination was mostly caused by the agitation in the compost pile. So at industrial compost facilities, they'll turn the compost to make sure that what's in the middle gets enough air um, and oxygen and water so that it remains an aerobic composting environment as opposed to an anaerobic environment like the middle of a landfill. Um, so those turning machines is going to, is what we think caused that delamination and peeling um, and breaking up of things, not actually the comp decomposition. So is that mechanical agitation, not the process of decomposition. Um, so paper plates are kind of a weird thing because a lot of these shiny paper plates are actually coated in clay and acrylic, but some of them are coated in straight plastic. And unfortunately for us as consumers, it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the two on the shelves, um, which is why we as EcoCycle just say no shiny plates um, because you can't tell the difference. Um, so clay coated plates really did pretty much break down at the end, but you can see it still didn't fully compost. Um, and we still ended up with about 10% of that uh, polyethylene at the end. And then we found that if the plastic fragment was smaller than half an inch, it would end up in the final compost because at the end of the composting process, most industrial uh, facilities will like sieve the final compost to get out any big sticks or chunks or mulch. Um, and so if anything's smaller than that, it's gonna end up in the final compost and then it's gonna end up on someone's garden or farm where they're growing their food. So all of the microplastics are gonna make it straight through that filtering process. The reason that this is such a problem is when composting started in the US, it looked a whole lot like this. So uh, the first composters were in California, or curbside composters were in California, and they encouraged people to cut the top off of their gable top cartons, fill it with their food scraps and store them in their freezer. And then when it was composting day, just to take that carton out and stick it on their curb. It was a really easy way to get high compliance from people. So to get people to compost, because it was easy, they didn't have to buy another bin, it wasn't stinky, which is an issue that a lot of people have with compost. Um, but this is about 20% polyethylene. So we know that this is resulting in plastic ending up in the finished product. So how do we change that? Um, oh, and another study, fortunately in 2018, so we did our study in 2008, and then 10 years later, a study came out from Germany in 2018 that did the exact, pretty much the same thing and found microplastics in their compost. So fortunately it was nice for 10 years later for someone to say, we found the same thing you guys did. Um, so it was nice to get the same results. And we know that when compost goes um, onto soil, that it's not gonna stay on the farm or the garden where it was placed. It's gonna rain and it's gonna run off and then it's gonna end up either in just the environment around it, or it's gonna end up in a stream, and then potentially end up all the way in a marine environment. So, to the good part. Um, so BioCycle is the like industry, like the industry magazine for composting. Um, and they put out a survey every two or three years where they survey all of the composting programs in the US. And the last one they did was in March of 2018. And as of March of 2018, there were 326 uh, residential composting programs in the United States, which when we started this in 2009, there were only 95. So that is a, just a huge win in and of itself that so many more Americans have access to residential composting, um, which means somewhere around 5.1 million households have access to composting. And this includes um, cities like San Francisco, uh, New York City is working on getting 
a residential composting program online to residents. So this is huge volumes of people are um, working on getting access to composting and diverting all of that waste from landfills. So in 2009, when EcoCycle started, about half of the programs in the US accepted some form of plastic coated paper. This uh, now they're down to less than 10% of the programs accepting some form of plastic coated paper. Now contamination is still a problem. So sometimes people put the wrong thing in the compost and that's still a problem, but at least the guidelines are clear and they're working on reinforcing those guidelines. So how we brought about that change is EcoCycle literally called all of those composting programs and worked on getting their guidelines changed. Um, so like how we did it this year is of the 220 programs that uh, BioCycle surveyed this year, 14 of them said that they accepted some form of plastic coated paper product. And then I went and further researched their guidelines to double check. And then it turned out only seven of them actually did. Um, one of those programs is in Vermont, six of them are in California. Um, and then I started calling people and being like, kindly and lovingly um, saying, hey, I'd love you to reconsider your guidelines so they'd be cleaner. Um, and then additionally, uh, every month I look up new composting pilot programs to try to catch them as they come online to see if their guidelines are clean or not. Um, and try to catch them at the very beginning of the process because it's a whole lot easier to change something at the very beginning um, than once people have an established program. And of course, this year everything got a little slowed because new composting programs stopped launching because of the pandemic. But one thing that I think is really cool, I put a map up, I made a map of the composting programs that started this year. And the thing that I think is coolest about this is they're not all in one place. And they're not all on the West Coast. They're not all in the Northeast. I think it's super cool to see that we're getting compost pro pilots all over the US. Um, and only one of them started without clean guidelines. So um, I think it's cool to see it spreading all over the US and not just in certain regions that you think of as being green or environmental, that it's kind of everywhere. Um, yeah, and so some new developments, and I don't know if this has changed because of COVID, but as of today, because today is July 1st, Vermont was supposed to start making um, <laughs> composting mandatory and start fining people for landfilling food scraps. Um, and then we started looking at Canadian composting programs because six out of 10 Canadian households have access to residential curbside composting. Um, which is 28 programs. Um, as of now, about half of those programs have clean guidelines. So, um, but unfortunately that kind of got sidelined because of the pandemic. Uh, a bunch of, Can almost all of Canadian composting programs are municipal, so they're city or government. And just like here, a lot of city employees got furloughed. Um, so it's hard to get a hold of people when they're not working. Um, but, one of the trickiest things for contamination and composting is what's called an oxodegradable product, which the next slide I'll teach you how to spot an oxodegradable product because it's really tricky. Um, and then clothing made from recycled products is obviously something for microplastics, which you're going to learn more about in a couple weeks. So an oxodegradable product is a conventional plastic. So it is a traditional plastic. It is a petroleum-based plastic that they've modified by inserting a metal ion halfway through the plastic chain. So instead of the plastic taking 450 or 500 years to break down, it'll break down in 10 to 15 years. So um, the inventors of oxodegradables, their logic was when they were seeing plastic scattered across the landscape, they were thinking, well, if it breaks down faster, it's less likely to hurt an animal because it's not gonna exist as long in the environment. But the problem is, is it does break down, but it breaks down into microplastics. And we learned that microplastics aren't always positive. Um, so some things to look for to see that it is a compostable versus a oxodegradable 
it has to say compostable for it to be compostable. And it should have this BPI logo on it. If it doesn't say compostable, it's not compostable. Um, oxodegradables often have words like biodegradable or degradable or earth friendly. Or my favorite, it says something like biodegradable and recyclable on it. So it'll have both words on it, which doesn't make sense because how can it compost and recycle? Um, so a lot of times it'll have something that looks like this. So it looks really close, but only things that say compostable can go in the compost. And then my last slide is some things about what Colorado has done. So in 2015, Colorado banned microbeads and cosmetics, yay! But um, according to our lovely pie chart over here on what the main sources of microplastics are in the environment, uh, microbeads are this tiny 2% sliver of the pie. So it's a great first step, but it's microbeads, I think are the easiest to regulate, so it's the first step, but it's definitely the smallest piece of the pie. Um, but some things that we can do is encouraging active street sweeping programs, which is something that people often don't think of. So road marking, city dust, and tires make up all of this piece of the pie for microplastics entering the marine environment. So by having an active street sweeping program, we can catch all of those things before they enter um, our storm drains and enter our freshwater ecosystems. And then you guys are gonna learn more about how hopefully we can change textiles. But um, if we already have textiles that are made from plastic fibers, um, having things like washing your clothes in a guppy bag or putting a filter on your washing machine or encouraging um, washing machines that already have filters built in, they can help with this lovely piece of the pie here. Um, so those are, the big things um, and really just reducing our plastic use in general. Um, a lot of the bills that were supposed to help with that, COVID killed. <laughs> um, but that is my lovely and um, slightly depressing talk on your intro, your very speedy intro to microplastics and you guys will be microplastics experts hopefully by the end of the month. And now questions. Brittany, that was awesome. Um, just a quick reminder, take a look down at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a Q&A bubble and a chat icon. If you have questions, please feel free to write them in there. Um, as this is really meant to be um, a webinar for businesses, I think it's very interesting to talk about are those. Um, one of the main phone calls I end up getting are from uh, businesses that have made packaging changes um, and they go, they're so proud of them. They're almost calling because they're excited and they, they want that like pat on the back and for us to say, you did such a great job. Unfortunately, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of are uh, plastic containers that say biodegradable or oxodegradable on them. So it's really important that, um, are developing packaging in any way, shape, or form to reach to a recycler. Reach out to the people who handle your material at the end of life. Um, it's, it'll save you a lot of trouble in the long run. It'll save you money because you're going to end up having to backpedal on a good bunch of things. And it's, you get to talk to us. So it's kind of a win-win, I would say. Yeah. Personally, um, something uh, something that a lot of folks have brought to my attention are those flexible uh, six pack rings. Since a lot of companies um, say that those are biodegradable, um, but they're not. <laughs> so if you're buying beer, use your rigid plastic six pack rings. Um, those we will take and recycle. Um, will actually reuse them. Probably not right now with COVID-19, but they do run them through a commercial dishwasher and then reuse them on their uh, cans. Could you, um, can you touch briefly on, you know, what's the difference between commercial compost facilities and what does 
residential mean with that? Does everybody have a commercial composting facility or what? Yeah, so like your when, for example, where we live, um, when our compost goes in our green bin and it's gonna go to a commercial compost facility. Um, the, but if you compost in your backyard, it's a little different. The biggest difference is how hot the piles get um, between a commercial compost facility and your backyard, um, which is generally why the rules are a little different. So you've probably heard if you're composting in your backyard not to put like meat or dairy or certain things in your backyard. Um, and that's generally to avoid like bad bacteria growing and also to avoid attracting things that you don't want in your backyard, like rats or raccoons or where we live, bears, um, or any of those scavengers that could definitely be a real possibility here. Um, but a industrial compost facility, because they get so much of a higher volume, their piles are gonna get a lot hotter. So their piles will get anywhere between 105 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is gonna kill a whole lot more of those bad pathogens that we don't want, which is why they can take things like meat and dairy. And they can take those, um, like the plasticky looking compostable cups that are still made from like cornstarch or something like that. But the higher heat can break those down. Whereas your, while it still gets warm, your backyard pile just doesn't have the oomph to break those down. Awesome. Um, so when we were talking about bioaccumulation, and this is not something I typically touch on in any of my talks for GSBs, um, would this, uh, the fact that we're passing through an animal and then going through the hemolymph, if I have that correct? Yeah. Um, so would this, not to be political or step outside of the bounds here, is this kind of also an argument for eating plant-based then, if you're trying to back on microplastic ingestion. Yeah, that eating plant-based or um, if you still want to eat meat, eating lower on the food chain. Um, so eating, say, a fish like a sardine. Um, so their sardines are filter feeders, so they're going to eat, they're closer to the bottom of the food chain um, than something like a tuna. Um, it's the same reason why like Pregnant women aren't supposed to eat tuna because of mercury. Um, because of the mercury bioaccumulates in tissues as well. Um, so that's why a fish like tuna is so much more dangerous because of mercury than something like a sardine because they're lower on the food chain. Um, and there's less of those animals at the top of the food chain. So think about a big predator. They need more volume or more space to hunt um, than something that's smaller. So eating plant-based, or if you still want to eat meat, eating lower on the food chain. Got it. That's interesting also that you brought up um, pregnancy as an example. My friend is pregnant, my best friend, and we've been talking about this, about fish and things like that, but it's interesting also to kind of spin it where, well, if it's going through your blood, bloodstream and you are a pregnant person, uh, microplastic in your newborn are something you almost need, you do need to think about. That's not, yeah. it's a little disturbing. <sighs> yeah, so I mean, that's, really that's why pregnant women have all of those regulations is because all, anything that mom eats or like breastfeeding women, anything that mom eats goes straight to her baby or her newborn. Um, so to me, if it's not good for a pregnant woman, it's probably not good for any of us anytime. <laughs> Valid rules to live by. <laughs> um, let me see. Okay, so folks do who, you know, what can businesses do? What can employees do if their business or organization isn't behind them 100%? And what can people do as individuals other than using a guppy bag when they're washing their, uh, their micro or their uh, plastic based clothing? <laughs> yeah. Um, so an easy thing is ensure that you compost cleanly. So making sure that you or your business um, is following those composting guidelines and not putting things in the compost that shouldn't go there. 
So that's a really easy thing um, that you yourself can do in your household. A sneaky plastic in the compost is um, stickers on fruit. I know that that's a battle in my house with my roommates. They always forget to take the stickers off. So I'm always digging through our compost bucket to like pull the stickers off. Um, so those are really easy um, personal changes. One thing that we're probably all doing right now is driving less. Um, so when we drive our cars, our tires wear down. And all of, because our tires go through a process called vulcanization to harden the tires, all of that results in microplastics being produced every time our tires hit the road. Um, so most of those steps are all gonna be small personal changes we can make um, to reduce microplastics. So composting cleanly, um, and then trying to reduce the amount of like plasticky clothing that you purchase in the first place, which I know is very difficult. I truly understand and empathize with that. I struggle. I am wearing a synthetic shirt right now because it's my work provided shirt. So I, I totally get that that is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but yeah, so reducing our amount of plastic petroleum based clothing, if you have it, wear, wash it in a guppy bag. Um, composting cleanly and driving less are four really easy personal steps. Um, and then businesses uh, making sure that they're composting cleanly at their business, which is much more difficult when you have lots of people. Um, and then looking at their packaging, like you talked about earlier, Kate, uh, making sure that it's not one of those sneaky <laughs> oxo-degradables um, which the companies that make those oxodegradables, I think are not doing it from a bad place. I think that they think that they created a product that is doing a good thing. Um, so it's very much marketed that way. And I, I really don't think that they're like an evil, I think they, they did it thinking that they were doing a good thing. I want to think that. Um, uh, and also like encouraging your employees to have bus passes. So at least they ride a bus instead of a car. So only the buses, you know, all of, all of the things that we should do anyway, also reduce our microplastics. So. I would say there's, you know, back to with like businesses, if you don't know what to do to cut out, you know, uh, plastic lined receipt paper and things like that, or yeah. if you need help setting up uh, proper collection systems within Business. That is why I exist in the capacity that I do at EcoCycle. Shoot me an email, give me a call, text me. I'm very open with that anytime. Um, microplastics, I'm sure you can imagine after this presentation, are just absolutely horrifying. And I will answer your question whenever I, whenever I can and whenever you ask. Um, something kind of fun to do, kind of depressing. I guess it depends on really how you look at it something going on called the Great Nurdle Hunt. Please look it up. Um, a nurdle is uh, like a pellet of plastic. If you go back to the study, I, study guide I provided last month when we looked at Plastic China, there is a link in it. I'll send it back out again for everybody at the end of this webinar with a link to the recording. Um, but they're doing something where you can go around to different areas where there might be, you know, a stream or the coast, depending on where you live. And you can start uh, taking notice of where there are nurdles and these little plastic pellets. Um, those get dumped into the ocean accidentally and, and they end up on your coastline and then they break down. And as they break down, they get into our water, our water system. So and they end up in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, that would be something that's kind of fun to do with kids and it's an easier way of approaching this kind of topic mm -hmm. um because you don't want to necessarily show them the really entire graphic photos of you know, seabirds and turtles mm -hmm. um Brittany, one quick question what do we do if we find microplastics so like i got compost this year and i my husband and i had a fun game of can you find microplastics as we were pulling out uh, uh, the compost, what do you do with them when, when you find them? So, I mean, what I do is I end up just throwing them in the landfill because they're too small for us to recycle um, because everything gets lost. Anything smaller than a bottle cap 
gets lost when it goes to the MRF. Um, so unfortunately, plastics that small just have to go to the landfill. Um, I usually put them in a plastic bag, um, like a zip top baggie, so that when it goes into my, uh, like into my, I, I live in an apartment, so I have a big dumpster, but so when it goes, it doesn't just like explode into everything, or I put it in like a plastic bottle or something like that, so I put it into a containment device um, that I also can't recycle. So, <laughs> so in some cases, the landfill is actually the right answer. It helps contain yeah. problem materials, and there's a case to be made that down the line, we'll be able to go back into landfills. Technology has evolved far enough so we can start reclaiming those materials rather than sending them in a one-way trip right to a hole in the ground and just letting yeah. it sit there. So <laughs> that's a great point. Um, we're not getting any other questions. So Miss Brittany, thank you so stinking much. This was awesome. Well, great way to kick us off uh, for our Plastic Free July um, series of webinars on microplastics forward folks like take a look at we're watching uh, chasing coral that should be perfect to follow up with this there's a study guide I sent out um, for guests that are visiting if you have any questions or do want to see that documentary uh, be part of a reading group or see like what books we recommended for this month and get that study guide shoot me an email at Kate C at ecocycle.org and I would love to share that information with you so once again, next week, 10.30 on Wednesday, the 7th, I'm trying to see my calendar, we'll have um, a professor from the Colorado Springs Mines talk about um, it's raining plastics, now what? <laughs> Since microplastics were raining in Rocky Mountain National Park. Brittany, again, thank you so much. This was awesome.